well do you understand personal income strategies and best practices for credit? Michael Eastham, president of Fellowship Financial Group, joins us to discuss a common sense approach to investing and spending. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Diane. Great to be here. Your book, um, Common Sense Income Strategies, I think is geared more for retirement, yeah. but money seems to be an issue for people no matter what their age. Would you agree? Absolutely, Diana, and, uh, and that's a great question just because of the fact that too many times people take a look at, um, at investments and they think that, well, I'm, I'm, I have to pursue a certain strategy just because that's what I read about, that's what I see in financial media. But, um, but the content of the book is very much geared towards anyone who has a conservative approach to investing and, um, and is very concerned about trying to build wealth over the long term. I think that when I was reading through your book too, I think that philosophy, I, I read a lot about millennials and uh, Generation Z being much more philanthropic, not so materialistic, but there were many elements in your book that I think that conservative philosophy would still apply to the different generational um, aspects. Yeah, I think that's true because if you look back a couple of generations where people, they were careful about the money that they had. They wanted to protect the, the dollars that they saved and worked so hard to collect over the years, they just didn't want to lose it. So they didn't take a lot of risk with it. They, they came up with the mantra to, to, to spend what you make and preserve your principal for down the road and for emergencies and for things like that. So that's really what it's geared toward. Now you talk about different strategies necessary um, for, for different people, income strategies, uh, goal-based, age-based, what does that mean and, and is there one better than the other? Well, the, the goal-based philosophy is one that, that I find works very, very well. Too many times today people try to think about a, a dollar amount that they want to have saved up. But the, the real question that I find is most effective with people is asking them, what's important to you about money? What's important to you about retirement? How much income might you need when you do retire? Because those types of questions make you look at the money a little bit different and, and make you look at the way that you accumulate the money uh, a little bit different as well. So that has a, a direct impact on your investment strategy. So goal-based is actually more customized than lumping everybody into an age category. That's right. And, and when you identify those goals, well, goals help, for, help you to prioritize. You know, what's mo what is most important to me? I also refer to it in the book as purpose versus performance-based investing. Am I just trying to buy low and sell high? Or am I looking at uh, identifying a purpose for my money and a purpose for the dollars that I'm saving and accumulating and the outcome is what kind of directs, meaning the goals are what kind of direct the way that I invest. Well then, when you counsel somebody about investments, what do you tell people to be wary of or alert for before they jump in to making an investment? Yeah, one of the biggest concerns that I have today is looking at the stock market at all time highs. People want to, uh, to jump on the bandwagon and too many times, you look historically, I've done a lot of study on stock market history and we talk a lot about market history in the book, but too many times people want to jump on the bandwagon when the market's already at the top. So if you're investing for performance or growth, then you don't want to buy high and sell low you still want to buy low and sell high. So that is, um, it's, it's too easy to just jump, get, get caught up in the momentum, get caught up in the froth as I describe it, and unfortunately you get caught. I see the logic in what you're saying and yet I think by just glancing at it you think, well, it's profitable, I want in there now, and I think a lot of people look at it that way. In terms of investments, I always thought or believed that owning my own home was a great strategy for a, a prime investment. I think a lot of people had that belief shaken um, or destroyed with the 2008 housing bubble burst. Now we've gone through recovery in the economy. Is it again a good investment? Well, Will we ever be backed yeah, to where I, that would be? I think, I think a home can be a good investment. 
if your expectation is to hold on to it for the long term, because if you think about it, you're gonna own something or you're gonna rent something, right? If you're gonna rent something, then you're gonna be paying to somebody else for the rest of your life. If you buy a house, even if you have a mortgage on it, at some point you're gonna pay that mortgage balance down and you will have an asset that has value to it. So you can determine down the road what you're gonna do with that asset. So it really depends on that and a number of other factors as to whether it makes sense as a good investment or not. I wouldn't count on that being a home run investment from an appreciation standpoint, but certainly over time it can be a good investment, a part of your overall strategy. You know, I think it's interesting too, somebody like me, I've been in my house for 34 years, and yet I look at a lot of the younger people that I work with now, and this might be their third or fourth job in different locations. So I think the whole philosophy of how we, where we live and how we treat our jobs um, changes maybe how we would invest, what's best for an investment for us. Yeah, that's exactly right. If I, if I have somebody that I'm talking to that, that is kind of a transient, meaning that they do change jobs every three to four years or so, and that's kind of part of their step up corporate strategy, a lot of times it doesn't make sense to buy a home just because of the cost. They don't typically weigh the cost of getting in and the cost of getting out. Right. You know, Michael, when I was reading for the show, I ran across a st st statistic that shocked me, and that was the U.S. Census Bureau said that the average American household um, is some $16,000 with credit card debt. I was shocked. That's a huge amount of money. Why so much debt? I think a lot of people um, are, are spending more than what they're making. They're not really paying attention to it. And, and some of it, it's easy to just uh, to point the finger at some at different places, but I will say that I think marketing in the United States has gotten incredibly competitive and incre incredibly successful. You have companies, credit card companies, that are trying to entice you by, you know, use our card for this and you get 5% cash back, or you get 3% cash back, or 2%. And what tends to happen is you, you buy into that and you forget about this card over here, and then you start using this one over here, and things start to build up and they snowball in a negative way. And before you know it, you've got a mountain of credit card debt. It's just very easy trap to fall into. You know, I think too, as you said, that it's a dual thing there where you have people that need it for necessities and then also that philosophy we have of self-gratification. Right. We want things now. I mean, I'm guilty of it as well. Um, and marketing can be very slick. What do you caution people about or what do you want them to be aware of with credit card usage? What would you say to them? Yeah, make sure that you understand your budget. Know what you can spend and then make sure that you're you're not spending more than you than you make it's it's kind of an easy mathematical equation but you're right the immediate gratification in today's environment is very difficult to overcome so you have to be very disciplined and you have to learn how to say no that's hard to um, to learn and cut back once you've had um, so many fun kind of treats that's right. too it is is the goal to eliminate credit cards is that, a, is that a healthy thing to do, or do you still want to use it with, with just some kind of caution? Well, I think you use it with caution, okay? But I do think that if you're one of those people that has the $17,000 in household credit card debt, well, you definitely want to get that paid off quickly because those are the high interest types of, um, of debt, and you want to get rid of it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a monkey on your back, a weight on your shoulder as you try to, to save. It's going to keep you from being able to accomplish your financial goals of saving. I always thought, though, that it was necessary to have um, at least two credit cards to establish credit and then to maintain that that status of credit that you have. Is that not true? It is true. It does help your credit score. So if you're thinking about buying a home, you want to you want to make sure that you have a solid foundation for an overall credit package and a credit score. But you don't want to overuse your credit because you have balances that are too high. That's going to bring your credit score down. So again, you have to be prudent in the way that you manage credit cards. Michael, with so many people having that much debt for whatever reason, that, how does that impact the ability to save, the desire to save? What are you seeing with your clients? Well, that's a great way to put it. The, not only the desire and the ability, the, the desire, but the ability to save. Number one, it, it hampers your cash flow, and number two, uh, that can get depressing over time because it, it becomes an oppressive thing. It's like I've got all this credit card debt, I don't know what to do with it, and it gets very difficult from a day-to-day -day standpoint. You hear about so many families having problems that are financial related. 
and a lot of it has to do with the fact that that the, there are ex excessive amounts of debt or credit cards that they don't know what to do with. What would be your advice if somebody's already really in debt of, yeah. I even think $10,000 is a lot, but if it's $10,000 or more, any common sense basic ideas to help? Yeah, I mean, there, there are really a few things that you can do. Number one is you've got to know your budget. How much can you afford to spend to pay down those credit cards if you're one of those folks that has too much credit card debt? Number two, pick a card, any card. Sometimes people look at the highest balance, sometimes the highest interest rate, and target that one first. Number three, make a bigger payment towards that targeted card and make sure you're making more than minimum payments, but as much as you can, minimum interest and principal payments towards the other cards. Once you pay that card off, then number four is roll that bigger payment to the next card and, uh, and continue on that method. You'll, be, you'll have a snowball effect that'll get the debt paid off in no time. And you'll have some, some singles and doubles and you'll feel good about the progress that you've made. I think that's a good point to make that psychologically you can really, the depression um, sets in and yeah. it's hard to make rational decisions. I think there's still a stigma too for people who have to admit that they may have a problem. Are there places, readily available places? I mean, I know people like you write books and, and give counsel, but are, are there other avenues that people can, can try to get some help? There are some debt consolidation companies or some uh, debt management companies that can help you, but you do have to be careful because some of those can have an adverse effect on your credit score. So you want to make sure that you understand how they work and how it, it actually would show up on your credit report if you're trying to manage your credit report. And this is all to try to avoid, you don't want to put the, 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 the debt in bankruptcy. You want to try to pay it off because really we all know in our gut instinct that it's the right thing to do. There are emergencies that come up in, in, in life circumstances that, that sometimes you can't avoid. But generally speaking, you want to try to make sure that you, you keep things on track. And yeah, there are some companies that are out there that, uh, that can help you to, to manage it. But again, be careful. Very or where, where you look to choose. Michael, you've been in the financial arena for a number of years. You're a CPA as well. I know you can't predict the future, but do you have concerns about another recession like we had in 2008 coming up in the next couple of decades even? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, certainly in the, in the next few years, just realistically, again, I've studied a lot of market and economic cycles, and the stock market being at an all-time high right now, I think right now we're likely to see a little more momentum or at least kind of steady eddy, if you will. But, um, but the market levels historically, um, from what I understand and what I've studied, tells me that we, we've got to see at least one more correction, whether it's 10 or 30 percent or 50 percent, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't predict when exactly that's going to be. But there are a number of factors that, uh, that support why I believe that that's the yeah. case. And so yeah. people do need to be careful. But again, I think it goes back to what you first said. It's the way you invest. Right looking at um, what's best for you on a goal-based priority and, and maybe sort of like a, a, more, a little more balanced approach than just jumping in when things are at the top of the market. That's right. You do want to be careful. You want to make sure you have a diversified strategy. And, you know, younger people can afford to take a little more risk because they can ride out a market correction. Right. But right. if you're... And someone like me. <laughs> if, you're in, if you're 65, you're 70 years old, and you're either on the edge of retirement or in retirement, then you need to make sure that that money is going to last you for 20 or 30 years. Thank you very much, Michael. My pleasure, Diane.